What a diverse landscape Australia has. From the rainforests high up in the mountains of far north Queensland to the dusty outback of our centre. At 30,000 feet, you really get to appreciate the beauty of this continent. Looking down from up high, it hits me how big my home is. And all I can do is stare. Stare at our coastline, at our cities, at our country, at my country. In 2014, I crossed this amazing country with a group of friends following the footsteps of the famous Birkin Wills, hoping to see the same country that they saw back in 1860. From Royal Park, Melbourne to the Gulf of Carpentaria, we'll be taking four ageing ex-military motorbikes and testing them and ourselves to the core. Like our motorbikes, we're also retired ex-defence members. And never before have our combined skills and training been put to work than on this adventure. It'll take everything we've got to complete this ride. Welcome to the Birkenwills Adventure of 2014. Technical update. We're only a few hours away from our final destination and my back wheel bearing has gone and I don't have any spare. And for this particular ride, it's over. So we're going to put the bike on the back of the uh, trailer. Although, um, you know, Cloncurry is just uh, in a half hour back down the road, we could go get a set of bearings. I'm happy to shelve the bike for now because tomorrow we've got a big ride to go back and we'll have one rider sitting in the car relaxing while we all rotate around keep these vehicles, the other bikes, going on the road. That should be our last technical update. It was a bitter pill to swallow. Just 250 kilometres to the finish after a record 2,900 kilometre ride and it had to end like this for me. But the fact that I had no spare bearings for my bike allowed me to make peace with the situation. But not Chris. Once again he quickly analysed the damage and he got busy with a plan. Technical update, um, George's bike. There was a big He's doing his best to uh, get out of the get bike it. ride because his bum's a bit sore and didn't like the dirt nah, stuff. <laughs> and this is the, this the bearing, this is the, the bearing out of the back of his bike. Uh, went, went that far away from um, Concurry. Yeah, we're going to have to go back to yeah, Concurry. Yeah, we're going to go back to yeah. and get some bearings. Fairly common bearings. A good friend of mine, Clyde Baxter, told me the part numbers of the bearings. So we're going to race back and um, go and get the bearings. And, this bike out. The man is amazing. Look, it doesn't take a genius to change a set of bearings, but I wouldn't have the faintest idea on what to do. Chris's can-do attitude is what has kept this adventure alive for me. It looks like I have a fighting chance to finally finish this adventure on my bike, but with only 30 minutes left to cover 70 kilometres back to Cloncurry, time is against us. So our situation is this. My head mechanic, Chris, will absolutely not entertain any idea of me putting the bike on the back of the trailer and calling it a finish for me. Not at all, not coming this far. So what we've done is we've made a phone call back into Cloncurry and they've got the bearings that we're looking for. So it's a race now, we've got to get there because the time right now is 4.40 and they close at 5 and we're a good 30 minutes out but we're doing our best to try and get there we're on an open highway so we're able to pick up a bit of speed we can't get these bearings it means we can't get to Karumba tonight we will get to Karumba tomorrow unless something else happens but we would very much like to get there tonight these are all the little adventures coming along just as we're close we are still so far. It's like a game of snakes and ladders. Every time we think we're ahead, mm. down the bloody snake. 
Be careful of what you wish for, a wise man once said. I'd been wishing for plenty of drama to keep this story alive. Well, it seems like I bloody well got plenty of drama, all right. We have six minutes and the place closes, but we have 5.6 kilometres to go yet, so we are racing to get in and get these bearings. Faster, Dave, faster! In Cloncurry, I collected the bearings while Dave went in search for a machinist to separate the bearing housing, something we couldn't do on the side of the road without a specialist tool. The good news the bad, bad news. What's the good news? Well, at the second place, I managed to get someone there that could have a look at it. He managed to get that off, but he broke the other bit, getting it off. What's the other bit? The bit we need. Nah, you're bullshitting you. That's what, he, <laughs> that's what he did to me and I nearly, I nearly died. You bastard. <laughs> Now, I didn't actually film us driving back towards the motorbike that day, so for the purpose of continuity, I'm just going to play the same footage and ask you to imagine that we're now driving northward back to the rest of the crew. Faster, Dave! Faster! Finally, after several hours, thanks to Dave and I stopping off for a cold beer and a homemade pie that actually had to be made on the spot, we returned just as the sun was setting in far north Queensland. The team got busy putting the new bearings in the bike and from what I can see it must have been quite hard work. But I'm only assuming that, as you can clearly see in the footage, I'm not helping in any way, preferring to film and tell the story. Anyway, that's my excuse for not lifting a finger and doing anything at all and I'm sticking to that story. You can't help but feel connected to this beautiful country when you're out in the outback. And something moved us so much at that moment that we just broke into song. Local song, that is. It's our final day of the expedition and we have just arrived at Camp 119 for the original Burke and Wills expedition. It's at this point here that Charlie Gray and John King stayed behind. They wouldn't end up going any more north, only Burke, Wills and Burke's horse Billy continued. They would make it up to the top of the gulf, however they wouldn't make it to the ocean because they went through mangroves. But once they tasted the salt water, 
they knew that those streams must be leading to the ocean, so they were very close by. But the horse kept getting bogged, and it took them two days. They decided to turn around, come back here to Camp 119, and from here begin their long trek all the way back to Cooper's Creek, where the main depot was. Let's go and have a look at Camp 119. We're finally here. At the end of our journey, more than 3,230 kilometres from Royal Park, Melbourne, where it all started. Chris, the human Google of mechanical repairs, made this adventure possible thanks to his remarkable mechanical and technical skills. By the way, Chris is not a mechanic and never was. He was just a mechanical enthusiast. Phil, who prepared and cooked every fantastic meal on our journey, also made this adventure possible. And Phil isn't a cook, but he did an outstanding job in planning, preparing and cooking those fine meals. Samantha, the only one who rode Big Red to the top on her first go, was by far our most skilled rider. She never once lost control of her bike that she called Raja after one of Burke's camels. By the way, she only got her license to ride a motorbike two months before our adventure started. And Dave, the man who gave us all a promise that he'd get us across Australia safe and on time, fulfilled his duty in fine form. His experience in mission planning, both in and out of the Defence Force, speaks for itself. This very place that we now enter marks the end of Burke's expedition into the unknown. It marks the end of his adventure and all that waited for him and his men now was the long hard journey home to a hero's welcome. And for us, it all began as a dream in 2012. A dream to follow some of the greatest explorers who ever lived. A dream to see what they saw and feel what they felt. These last 18 days have changed our lives forever. And only now do I get what being Australian is all about. The amazing journey opened my eyes to what it's all about here in this country. Courage, determination, mateship, hard work, humour, freedom and the total respect of our land. It's a land that commands that respect. Let me have a look at that bottle of wine we've got there. Dave, where did we get it from? The Burke of Wolves Winery in Victoria, near one of their earlier camps. It's travelled all the way with us. We had another bottle at the dig tree. And it's only fitting that we share the tipple in their memory. Absolutely. This marks the end of the Burke and Wills trip for us after two years of planning. We've just poured ourselves a, a, a cup each of uh, the Mr. Burke wine. To my expedition and team members, thank you very much for making it happen. It was awesome and I loved every minute of it. Cheers to Cheers. Burke and Wills thank and our expedition. I couldn't believe the adventure was now complete. As I embraced Dave, I was overcome with emotion. We all were. For those of you who have followed our adventure from the very start and thought, these guys really are best friends, you're right. Someone famous once wrote, if you have one true friend, then you have more than your share. Well, how lucky am I to have all these guys? From this final camp in the north, it was time to ride to the little town of Croydon, 150 kilometres southeast from Camp 119. It was time to sit back and relax.
as our adventure comes to an end, we've pulled up on our last night. We're going to be staying at a caravan park and spoiling ourselves by actually having showers before we go home to our families. We're in the small town of Croydon and it is absolutely beautiful. The local population is probably less than 200, but I'm not sure about that. I'll ask some of the locals when I go inside the bar. Have a look at the sunset behind me. Croydon is the ghostly remains of a once thriving ghost town. In the early days, it was the fourth largest colony in Queensland with a population of 7,000 people. But all that ended when the gold ran out in 1927. According to the census of 2011, there is only 312 residents living here today. As we started our journey, we camped by the car in Swags, and as we finish our journey, we camp in Swags by the car. And here's Georgie boy. How do you feel today, George? Mate, I'm sad because we're going home. I mean, I'm happy to be going home and see the family, but I'm sad knowing that this will be the last time I'll sleep in a swag until we do Ludwig Leichhardt next year. <laughs> I don't know. Oh. <laughs> How's it like sleeping out under the stars, bro? Do you know what? It is great, but this is the only time I've done it, the whole trip, and this is the right climate for it. It's warmer, there's no wind, there's no dew, but it is awesome. And what do you think, this is the last day? Like I said to everyone this morning, everyone for the final time, good morning. Good it's, morning. A, it's actually quite a, um, yeah, there's an emptiness feeling inside me, but yeah. I yeah. had the same feeling, but I went to the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Sam and Chris. And, oops, that's not a sight we need to show mm. the boys and girls at home. Mm. Mm. How are you this morning, Chris? Yeah, I feel like I've had a few beers last night. Well, I think Here we actually Croydon. may have had um, a couple of bevos. Mm, that was a good night. That was a night. I had some, uh, ran some more very uh, entertaining our travellers that we met up with last night and um, saw many stories. Indeed we did. George was great entertainment as per usual. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, how are you this fine morning? Very good. Very good. Got a little bath put under us. Yeah, I've enjoyed um, camping out under the stars. I've got to see so many shooting stars in all my life. It's just amazing. We were very lucky not to have any moon during the um, couple of weeks that we've been camping. Mm -hmm. So no moon just meant more stars. It was really good. Indeed it was. Indeed it was. I love the experience. Thank you. Every morning as part of our routine, I'd play the one song that we all knew and loved. Not a single morning passed without us playing our morning song, and now, whenever we hear it played on radio or TV, memories come flooding back of these great days. As we packed our equipment up around us that last time, I was thinking the same thing that everyone else was thinking. This is it. The big adventure is over. Hey, true blue. Don't say you've gone Say you've knocked off for a smoker For me being a homebody and someone who hardly goes camping I was worried that I might never get a chance to be part of anything like this in the future Samantha and Chris would soon be catching a flight back home and Phil would soon be deploying with the army for an extended period Put simply this was not only the last of the Birkenwills adventure, but possibly the last time we'd ever be part of something as a Royal Cavaliers. But all good things must come to an end, and we just had to deal with that fact that this journey of ours was seeing the last dawn. In the end, all our bikes made the 4,700 kilometre journey thanks to Chris. Samantha's brake problem was finally identified and it had nothing to do with Yamaha engineering. Wearing new boots and being new to riding, she often mistook the brake pedal for her foot peg, resulting in the brakes constantly gripping and finally clamping tight when the pressure was too much. 
The oil consumption on Samantha's bike was put down to a seized ring in her piston due to the bike sitting around for five years between starts. Once the ring came free and expanded in the cylinder, her bike never lost a drop again. It turns out these 23-year-old Yamaha motorbikes were the best investment I ever made and I highly recommend them. When any other 23-year-old bike from a rival manufacturer can do what these bikes have just done, then I'll class them as legendary bikes like these ones. In the end, our ride was simply one day over schedule, but that one day would put a huge rush on things. With 900 kilometres left to ride back to Townsville, we did our best to keep our brakes short. But we ran out of time and we had to leave our bikes in Greenvale to avoid riding at dusk. We had to get back home as Chris and Samantha were flying back to their home in less than 24 hours. So we joined Dave in the recovery vehicle and he got us all back safe. Well that's it, we are finally home. We've just rocked up to my house. My daughter Abigail it made me? this for me. It was the first thing I saw as the roller door opened up. Is it and, I, and I do feel welcomed at home. Abby, thank you Is so much. And I stink. Right now I still stink because I had a shower yesterday but rode through dirt Did today. It's not dirt, but look. Out back. That's it. Expedition over. We have saved ourselves some Birkin Wills wine from the Birkin Wills winery. Dave, a glass for you for keeping us safe. Samantha, a glass for you for keeping us well fed and brushing our teeth and flossing twice a day. Taking medicines. Taking medicines as well. She looked after us. Awesome. Christopher, what can I say? With this symbolised, where every drop symbolised every minute you spent fixing the bike, so I don't think need a bigger glass. you need a bigger glass. <laughs> To the crew that made it happen, Phil unfortunately has already gone home, he turned off earlier on, so he's celebrating at home by himself. Guys, the Birkin Wheels. Birkin Wheels. What an adventure. So if his filter didn't get sorted out, do you reckon by the end of the trip his bike would have been ratchet? Oh yeah, it would have been dusted as well. So I saved your bike. Well done. Mate. This is what I'm doing for yous. <laughs> doing for all of yous. <laughs> <laughs> because earlier on, I installed a voltmeter. Huh? Huh? Look at that. Huh? Huh? Can, can Me? Viewers, can viewers tell that he's Greek? Look at all that crap sitting up there. You know what? <laughs> no, it's no room for fluffy dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, I give up. Phil, what's for dinner tonight? George, you tell our viewers what they're cooking. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's a more. As if it wasn't bad enough. Chris had to go and humiliate me to the rest of the riders as well. God, I hate him. I hate him. It won't last, eh? Eating this stuff. So we're going to have to cut an end off George's mattress, soak it in a bit of engine oil and try and make an air cleaner. Which bikes do you think, if any, will make the whole journey? I, I, I seriously think they'll all make it, but we're just being, we may be inconvenienced by a few things we might have to patch up. We've also got a custom exhaust system on this bike too. The word adventure, yeah, that's the um, operative word. La 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 la, come on people, get a partner, let's dance, let's amore. What's that ridiculous thing George is wearing on his head? Is it underpants? Well, no, it's not underpants. It's this, when I ride, because it gets very cold out there, it's this. When I get home in Townsville, I'm gonna break your ass.
Hey, break your ass! Over. So that concludes the end of our 2014 documentary, Our Birkenhills Adventure, Crossing the Country. Before I go, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a behind the scenes look at what it takes to put a little documentary like this together. I'm by no means a filmmaker, I'm just your average Joe who wanted to capture a great experience like that and put it on film and share it with everybody. So what does it take to put something like this together? Well, let's talk about the expedition. Of course, it's very important to plan it, and we gave ourselves a couple of years to plan that, so we had done a lot of thinking about it, and, uh, and we didn't do too bad, to tell you the truth, and we pretty much got a lot of the pre-planning uh, right and the execution of going down to Melbourne, getting our bikes ready and sort of going from there. That was all planned. But when it comes to the documentary side of it, you know, you never really know how this thing is going to play out. It could have ended on day one. So for us, it, it, it was organic. It would slowly sort of reveal itself. The biggest trick, of course, was to be able to capture everything and record it all. And, and, and filming everything is the most important part to a good documentary. And how did we do it? Well, believe it or not, more than 98% of the footage that you've watched over the eight-part series was shot here with my iPhone 5. And iPhone 5 captured all those great moments. But there are scenes where we're riding on the highways, on the dirt, the, the, the dirt highways, and, and, and the scenes where I chase camels and emus, uh, and that is shot on this, my little GoPro. And my GoPro is very important because it was mounted above my helmet or various locations on my bike. I wasn't the only one with a GoPro. We had GoPros sort of spread around bikes so to capture different vantage points. But I'll be honest with you, we didn't use these as much as, as much as we could. The quality of these are absolutely fantastic. But for some reason, um, my humble phone seemed to be the best option for us to film with. And, uh, and everybody got behind using that phone. Another thing that makes our documentary really interesting is your choice of music. Now, I'm very lucky because I come from a musical background. So as you can see behind me here, I've got a Tyros keyboard, a number of guitars here, a number of musical instruments. And the most important thing for me was to write my own score. I wanted my own music for the documentary. And all the music in my documentary is mine, written by me and recorded by me, bar two particular pieces of music. And of course, one is the Legendary True Blue by John Williamson. That wasn't recorded or written by me. And the other one was a piece written by Terry Kennedy, a very good friend of mine, called Where Are They Now? And uh, that's just a simple guitar piece. Everything else, every other piece of music that you hear in the documentary was recorded and thought of right here in my little studio. And it's very important because the last thing you want is once you upload your, your video and get it out there, straight away uh, YouTube is going to turn off the audio on it because there's a uh, audio compromise on it and because of copyright they will shut off your audio and I didn't want to go through that but last of all guys have a lot of fun I use this little bit of software over here it's called Filmora it costs $21 to buy it's uh, Mac friendly I wanted to use my Mac and it's typical like most software you know it glitches it crashes it, it carries on it does unexplainable things but just bear with it it is a lot of fun you will put it together it's taken a year to put this whole documentary together because I'm not very good at learning how to use software so it took a while for me to sort of understand how to use it and that's it guys that's the end of the Burke and Mills documentary I'll see you in 2016 when our next exciting adventure is happening keep an eye out for the Royal Cameleers <laughs>